Thank you all. Just, just to get an idea, uh, can I see hands on who in this room considers himself on the blue side of things? Half is, so the other half is red. And do we have uh, in the red, team, red team operators, penetration testers? Awesome bunch. Yeah, so we've got a nice 50 50 uh, split. Well, as, uh, as introduced, uh, we are from Outflank. And we're going to talk about OPSEC failures that are made by blue teams and especially how we, uh, as, as red team operators, uh, monitor what's happening out there and what we see on our infrastructure. About us? I, Mark, uh, started uh, coding on mainframes uh, just before the Euro conversion and the year 2000 problem and all that stuff, so the black screens with green letters. Found out quite fast that I was not the average developer. Doesn't also mean that I was better, I'm just not a developer. I'm not structured enough to be a proper developer. But I did have my way with computers, so I rolled into security. Uh, did that for a while and started being really offensive security uh, as of 2004. Uh, now I'm a red team operator, uh, I'm also lazy, so if I do things twice or three times I tend to develop something around it to make it easier for me. Uh, my colleague Mark is here as well. Yeah, so my, my name is Mark, you can follow my ramblings on Twitter, the hashtag MarkoffIP. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here and I want to thank the, to the conference organizers for us to allow us to talk about this topic. Uh, my official information security career started in 2006. Before that I had a, a background in system and network engineering, uh, making things nowadays are break things. Um, most of my part is still a head team operator. I built some tools to ease my work. Uh, also recently I had the experience of doing some, uh, some threat hunting experience at the blue side of the company. So fully aligned with the, uh, the keynote, um, I want to say that it really helps a red teamer to be on the blue side, and otherwise as well, the blue team where I'm working right now really benefits from the red team experience that I bring to the whole threat hunting and the whole uh, soccer market. So, yeah, so that's, that's the company Outflank. Yeah, then a short note about, uh, about Outflank, what Outflank is, and why we even found it, because there's plenty of security firms out there, and why, why find a new one? Uh, we saw that, that often pen testers move to being red teamers, and those two are, in our opinion, different kinds of creatures. Pen testers are not red teamers, red teamers aren't always pen testers. So uh, even though they have uh, similar skill sets, the way they operate should be uh, quite different. So that's why we found uh, Outflank about uh, three, three and a half years ago uh, to specialize in, in red teaming. Uh, we tried, to, we built a small team, we're now at six people, uh, all with a decent amount of experience. So we don't have on, only the tech on board to do proper red teams, we also have a vision on how red teams should be done. Uh, before we dive into our product, what we're building, and how we try to improve our work, I first want to dive a bit into what we think red teaming should be. So at least then we're all on the same page. We might agree, we might not agree, but at least then we know what we, how we define red teaming and how we, uh, how we see it. Uh, we often like to compare red teaming with this image. Uh, a boxing match. Well, not a match, a training game. Uh, if, you're, if, you, if you consider the red team to be the trainer, uh, then there's no use in knocking the blue team out. Breaking in, stealing all their gold, going away, make a dance, write a report. There's no learning in that. The, the blue team is not going to improve by doing that once, twice or five times. They might learn from the report and they might build some, some more detections uh, to find what you specifically did at that point. But you're not going to really train them in their daily operations, especially if a, if a real actor will once knock on the door. So how we see red teaming is more uh, in a sparring situation. Uh, we even would go as far as to state that a red team that was undetected due to the whole operation is a fail for the red team as well. Red teams should move towards being detected. They should move towards engage with the blue team because only that is how a training match works and how a training match can be used to improve capabilities on both, both sides. Well, before we dive uh, deeper into the, uh, the, uh, the Red Elk and the tool we're going to present, uh, I want a word on how our infrastructure looks like, and I think it's really uh, closely aligned to what we see out in the wild. Uh, we have the customer here on the left side, and a line of redirectors in between, and then we have the command and control server that we will be operating on. We tend to use a lot of cobalt, uh, we tend to use cobalt strike a lot, of course, other platforms might be just as good and just as usable. Uh, and even then, you'll end up with a similar uh, 
IT infrastructure on the offensive side, being a layer of redirectors that you use to reroute uh, or do more intelligent stuff, but at least you use to reroute your C2 traffic to your uh, backends. Now, well, this is the, sch the schematics, but as soon as we start doing an offensive operation where we might run three scenarios at the same time, and within this one scenario, one of my colleagues will always ask him, Mark, can I have another uh, profile, C2 profile, for this specific scenario? So quite soon, we'll, we'll find ourselves having at least four or five command and control servers on the back end, uh, up to 15, sometimes even 20 redirectors, uh, where there's a lot of need of uh, manual additions in how we want to divert traffic, how we want to monitor traffic, where we want to send it. I think the basic message is things get complex quite fast, also on the red team side of things. And we quite often have over 40 or 50 systems that we just spun up over the last few weeks. And yeah, we want to keep an eye on what's going on, on the, what's happening on these machines, who is pinging them, who is uh, uh, visiting the sites on there, who is talking to C2 and so on. So that's for, where for the red team a big challenge is, and only if the red team is in, is, is in control of its operation, that's the place where we can yeah, help the blue team in the best way possible. Okay. Let's do that, I guess. Yep. So our infrastructure grows exponentially. We try to, or we tend to lose oversight as long uh, when the infrastructure grows and grows, more components are added. So we're having roughly said two challenges with our infrastructure. Remaining in a position of proper oversight and having proper insight during the operation. We want to know what's going on. If you look at the concept of oversight, let's look at cowboys. They have typical challenges. They have their herd, which is running around everywhere. Um, they want to know if their herd is in proper shape, if they are alive, where they are, etc. all these things. Um, so they have a, about the same type of uh, changes with the oversight. If you look at the insight that we want to get, I want to reference back to uh, the French Sherlock Holmes. This is a picture <coughs> of uh, Mr. Locard, Edmund Locard. He was in the early 20th century. He was the first person on, uh, with forensic science to do it properly. Scientific-based, evidence-based practice. He used actually scientific measures to go to the crime scene and do the investigation. He used raw data to get the proper insight. Um, so he is most famous for his statement, uh, which is every contact leaves a trace, um, for principle. And this actually goes both ways. Every interaction that red does will leave a trace for blue to find. Every interaction that blue does will leave a trace for red to find. And that's interesting, that's an important thing to remember. So, with those two challenges that we have, let's look at the tools that we can use for getting better at that. So, the dogs that are used by the cowboys, the microscopes that are used by, uh, by uh, forensic investigators, um, we do not have something like that for own, our own infrastructure uh, to look at, or our own operation. So we need to create something ourselves. Um, that's what we came up with. I apologize in advance for this awesome picture. Uh, if there's anybody in the room who has some creative uh, uh, background that can make a better picture, we are open to that. Uh, but at this moment, it's just uh, this, uh, this elk with a uh, red sunglass. You've already put it on stickers, I believe. We do have a few stickers, indeed. Um, so, um, <coughs> red elk <coughs> combines the two things that we need to fix, oversight and inside. You can read the blog where we introduced this. Uh, you can go to our GitHub uh, because we thought this is important as well because there's no such thing in the community at this moment, so we open sourced it. Uh, feel free to play with it, either if you're on the red side or on the blue side. What does it do? Well, let's have a more higher overview of how a network uh, or an operation should look like. On the left side, you will have the target network, the, the, the client that we're trying to hack. Normal C2 traffic and normal attack traffic will always flow through a redirector, uh, just as uh, Mark, my colleague, has said. So there's a first line infrastructure which will have reverse proxy, domain fronting, uh, 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 normal websites, tracking pixels, everything goes through a first line of uh, infrastructure. Um, and then there is some traffic that is allowed to go through as uh, C2 traffic back to our C2 servers, which can be multi multiple. Basic image, right? Let's put in red. 
Red Elk does a few things. Of course, the Elk within Red Elk stands for Elasticsearch Log Stash and Kibana. The okay, <laughs> is it better? Okay. Um, so Elasticsearch Log Stash Kibana, uh, the NoSQL uh, uh, data set with Kibana being the front end for it and Log Stash being the, the whole log uh, uh, cropping filtering uh, thing. Um, Red Elk gets its data using FileBeat, a component that reads all the log files from the redirectors or anything within the, the first line of infrastructure, as well as the logs from our team servers during the operation. So we get traffic data as well as operational data. Uh, and on the right side, you will see another picture for data copy, which means that we transfer specific files during the operation as well back to our central Red Elk server why we want to have one central overview of all screenshots, all downloaded files, all keystrokes, everything during the operation which was spread across multiple team servers, we want to have one central location. So we're transferring that back to the Red Dog server. We're making some dashboards, we're storing it into indexers, uh, we're doing enrichments of the data that is coming in. We, of course, as it's being a big search engine, we can do some searching with it. Uh, and with that, we can have a proper access for the red team as well, if you might want to do that, uh, have the white team as well uh, look into some of the data. Of course, for, for the blue team, it's, it's not, not that weird, it's actually not new at all to collect data, put it in one place so you can look at it. But you would be surprised to see how little tooling there is for red teams to do this properly. Exactly. So, pretty simple, right? We're putting in some, uh, uh, some elk stack in the middle, put in some logs, do some filtering, do some enrichment, that's it. Huh? Well, let's look what happens when the blue team actually finds some artifacts of our attack. The SOC starts to do some analysis. They will find a piece of malware on their systems, they will do some analysis. Uh, that analysis can include basically querying for the NDFIs or other IOCs to online security service providers, I'm thinking of SpamHouse, VirusTotal, IBM X4, some online resources. That's interesting. Because those online service providers will start doing live analysis and will start searching on the IP addresses or DNS names of our infrastructure, which will be the first line of defense. And as we're getting the data, we will get it into Red Elk. Many times analysts as well start querying our infrastructure as well. So there is communication from the SOC, perhaps a different uh, upload, uh, uh, perhaps a different external IP address back to our infrastructure. And here comes the SIM functionality. Um, we can query for all those attacks or these artifacts or the IOCs at the online service providers as well as we, because we've got all the data inside the ELK stack as well, we can query smartly in our own data, which will give us some rule-based alarming functionality. So that's the high vision. Now let's talk about specific infrastructure components that are supported at this moment. Like my colleague Mark said uh, already, we tend to use Cobalt Strike quite a lot. We built this in the beginning for Cobalt Strike, so it has a full support for Cobalt Strike. If you're using Cobalt Strike, this is a tool that you actually want to, uh, you might want to dive into Red Elk. There is no custom CNA required. Everything is done with the out of the ba uh, box experience. Um, we are working on Faction C2 as well as Empire for the, uh, the team server components to have that included as well. We're working on that. It will be released somewhere um, in the next few months and you are encouraged to help us with that. We're gaining one location for all the logs, all the data, every, everything from the entire operation to one central location and we're doing some heavy enrichments. Talking about the redirectors, we started with uh, HA proxy. It's a proper tool. <coughs> we will be working on support for NGNX and Apache. That will be somewhere in the near future. Uh, again, you are encouraged to help us. Every, depending on, well, every redirector, uh, reverse proxy tool that you will use, you will need to adjust some type of logging because <coughs> in the basics, they will never log, they never, will never give you enough information. Custom logging is required. <coughs> All the traf uh, traffic is logged, and then we can do some enrichments with, for example, gray noise, which is awesome, or Tor address. We know which Tor addresses are there, and we can include that. As well, we know which IP addresses are of our own team, as well from the blue team. And we can tag those addresses within the stack um, to make smart decisions. 
of course, that's something you have to set manually. Before we start, we'll find our own uh, test labs or we'll test our own beacons, we'll test our setup. We'll put this in, these in an IP list. As this is the red team, don't alarm on that, it's, it's ourselves. And we'll make a list as soon as we can, after first contact is, uh, is there with the customer, to gather the IPs they often use. And yeah, you might have someone working from home and you, you wouldn't know that, know that IP here. But the base IPs they use, you can also put them in, in a text file saying, okay, this is what we expect to be the customer. And all other IPs might be worth investigating. Yep. Okay, graphical wise, no rocket science here. Huh? So there's data from your actual target, there's data coming in from, from non-target IP addresses. It's on the redirector, you can make some smart routing over there, either redirect to your bogus website or uh, uh, whatever, and maybe redirect some data back to your CPU server. Yeah, I, I think what's worth mentioning here is that the redirector, but I think the, the picture is clear on that, the redirector is more than just SOCOT, it's more than just our IP tables, which force everything. We try to make these redirectors smart somehow and divert in uh, non-C2 traffic so it will never end up on our uh, um, team server and diverting that to a bogus website or to some other tool that we might use for some reason. So internet traffic, internet traffic, and C2 traffic will hit our infrastructure. Uh, any reverse proxy tool that you will use will make use with, send it to a specific destination. And depending on the name that you give for that de destination, you will see that back into Red Elk. Um, important thing to note, if you start using Red Elk, you will need to do some configuration yourself. The installer of Red Elk will not fix your reverse proxy for you. There's a wiki, it's not that hard, but just be uh, aware of that. File beat reads the logs, forwards it all to Red Elk, Logstash receives it, does some enrichment, uh, and stores it <coughs> in Elasticsearch. And there's a few backend processes going on. Every minute, extra enrichment is done on the data that's being received. For example, tagging which specific IP address, if it was from the red team or from uh, the target or some other known actor uh, for which the IP address is known, we can tag those things and make smart decisions with that, with the data afterwards. <coughs> Every two minutes, we sync specific files from the team server. And every five minutes, there's a rule-based SIM-like uh, functionality. Uh, and I will show you in a minute how the thumbnails actually look like. Because we're transferring the screenshots, we do some processing on not having the big screenshots, but having small thumbnails, so you can easily go through that. Well, one reason for wanting this is that we, uh, I often uh, have to manage all the team servers. And I get multiple requests from team members if they can have SSH keys on the team server so they can query through the log files that Cobalt Strike uh, writes to disk and so on. And then they have to log into five machines and come back to me that they can't find the data and so on and so on. So now it's all in one place. We want to see everything. Great. So let's pray for the demo gods. Uh, we've got our uh, Red Elk instance uh, here. Um, and you will be welcomed with the normal Kibana interface. Um, let's just go to Discover. Yep, there it is. So this is like a typical Kibana interface. For the people not familiar with this, I will walk you through it. Uh, we're in the Discovery. This is the section where you can look at the raw data. Uh, this is a search field where you can do some live searching in the data. You can select on the top right, you can select the time period that you want to uh, search in. And there is a, uh, a timestamp period uh, indication where the data will be received. And on here below, you will see the raw data. OK, I don't like this type of columns, or there is no structure in that. So we created a, a few uh, views for you. Let's start with timeline overview, which will give you an uh, overview of the commands and actions taken by every head team operator. It's parsing the Cobalt Strike logs and, and giving you some information. So, got a timestamp, a specific name for an attack scenario. You will give these names yourself. Uh, the specific username that this target beacon was running on, internal IP address, some beacon ID, um, the host name, operating system, and the actual message of the log file. You can remove things as you want. And you can get to a bit more raw data in this. This is default Kibana stuff. Messages are stored here. So let's look at 
a dip, different view. I again, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving out every join leave events, uh, new beacon events, weblog events, etc. I'm focusing for specific input commands, and I'm focusing for a specific attack scenario because during a multi-month engagement. Afterwards, let's just say we want to give the blue team the proper information about a specific attack. Let's say we hit an SSH, uh, we try to do an SSH connection to a specific system, uh, and we want to give that detailed information back to the blue team. The data is in there, all you need to do is live searching. We know it was within this attack name. These are all the commands being parsed somewhere. Uh, let's just search for SSH, and it will do some querying. And here you will see that the specific operator at a specific time hit the SSH command, and at feature that I really like is that we created some hyperlinks to this and you can easily just get the full beacon log of that specific operation and you can use a normal uh, Apple GF or a searching uh, window in your browser. All the data is one central location, it will give you overview. If, you, if you're in a, in a blue team, go and ask one of your red team members to, uh, to send you all the commands for user X on system Y. I'll, I'll tell you they'll start sweating. We did a similar thing with an overview of all the indicators of compromise. At the end, you might want to give the blue team uh, an overview of all the IOCs that you uh, did. Uh, simple click, this is the overview. Uh, it will list everything that's generated by Cobalt Strike, so every file uploaded, every file created. Um, and here, of course, you can <coughs> share these, you can get your CSV report. This is just default Kibana stuff. Um, it will generate a CSV file for you which you can download. Um. Yeah, we really tend to put all our ICs in here. So even if we send out a phishing mail in which we attach or HTML smuggle a Word document, we will upload that same document to one of our own test beacons just to make sure that it's in here. Because this system is monitoring virus total and all the others. So even if not the blue team, but the user decides, hmm, uh, on hindsight, this document was a bit odd, let's upload it to virus total. But at least, at least we get an alarm that some of, some, someone at the client decided to upload that document. And we might decide to clean up the persistency we had on that user's desktop or build another persistency somewhere else. At least it gives us uh, to be in control of, of our scenario and to decide what we want and how we want to engage with the blue team and train them to be better. Yep, exactly. So simple IOC overview. Same goes for keystrokes. When I'm in a long operation, I don't remember that specific system where we had that specific key log. So I don't want to log into every specific team server to go to query through the uh, key logs. I want to have one central location. Same goes here. It's a big list and you can click again on the link to get the full uh, text based uh, log. Screenshots. Simple overview. I do remember that specific screenshot that I saw some weeks ago during the operation which had that very important application on it. I can quickly browse through this list and, well, in this case, actually catch some uh, antivirus uh, boxes with this, which will have a big role in receiving hybrid analysis. Again, link to the bigger screenshot. Uh, for okay, so that's all on the operations. Yep, w we make a lot of screenshots during our operation because as we see, feel red teaming, or at least a scenario that you plot, <laughs> usually has an out phase as well. You want to reach something, you want to go to a certain goal. Uh, for most of our red team operations, being domain admin is in the end. It's basically the start of, of actually getting to the business crown jewels. That's how you also involve the business in an exercise like this. At which means that sometimes for days or even weeks, we might, might have to key log and screenshot users in order to learn how they uh, how they work, what their daily operation, operation is. We don't know all the business uh, stuff on the application, so we have to learn from the users and the daily procedures and on how to get to what we consider our goal. Uh, we'll, we'll do that through screenshots, and that's why it's so valuable, uh, valuable to us to have that at all in one location. Okay, cool. So what I just showed you was all about operations during the red teaming, as in commands typed by the uh, operators. So let's take a quick look about specific data. We'll uh, requests that came back to the, uh, uh, that touched our infrastructure. So we got a different view, which is on the uh, re redirected traffic. Um, it will give you the same type of columns, scenario, uh, uh, the destination that the uh, reverse proxy actually chose, which could be your decoy or your cobalt strike, or this is the name that you give it yourself. Uh, and it does some enrichment on source IP address and some GOIP tagging, and it will give you the full request and stuff like that. 
Uh, enrichment is also done with the tags. So you will see here that there's an IP list for red team and IP list for the customer. If you define these within the configs, tagging will be done automatically and you can quickly just select for every specific customer request. Okay. Um, I've got a few more examples. Uh, simply searching for known antivirus um, systems or, or uh, yeah, systems. It's as easy as this. this. You will get all the information from where antivirus systems are doing live interaction with your infrastructure. This is interesting. I've got a more few examples, but we're running low on time. So let's go back to uh, the presentation. So back up things for if. Yeah. This is the interface of Symantec EDR, their next generation EDR solution. Um, and why did I pick this screenshot? Well, look at the two arrows below. There are two easy clickable things for the operator. One is submit to sandbox, which is Symantec's own specific sandbox, and there's submit to virus total. It's made easy for the blue team to upload stuff to online live uh, analysis. A blue team or the customer in general. Often if you speak to blue teams, they would say, we would never upload anything to an online service. But we yet have to find the first customer where we didn't hit an alarm. This is, nowadays it's called Microsoft uh, Defender ATP. <coughs> Again, two screenshots, uh, uh, two buttons. Uh, one is that actually it already does an, uh, uh, a check with online virus total. And the second one is if you want to submit it for deep analysis at the Microsoft uh, uh, analysis cloud thingy. Funny thing is that because we're getting the beacons back, or at least because we're analyzing the data, we can see which specific systems are being uh, uh, getting a beacon back. It's a bit <coughs> smaller size, but you will see the amount of, these are system names, admin PC, uh, John PC, uh, stuff like that. And compared to the different uh, attacking scenarios, you will see that many times, well, it's pretty obvious. Uh, Sandboxes will stand out. These do not look like your average target a computer name. Uh, it's a clear indicator. Ba basically, this data you could give a full presentation on. What we see is if you post something to a sandbox, you will likely see that sandbox call back to you. And then half an hour later, two other sandboxes pop up where you never submitted yourself because they're sharing data. And that will go on for a few hours and then it will be quiet. And if your malware did evil stuff, then the next morning or a few hours later, you will have a huge wave of investigators and sandboxes flowing all over. <laughs> Apparently, people that buy all the samples that, that go into these sandboxes and try and uh, reanalyze them themselves, and you'll have a huge wave of, uh, of incoming connections. You'll also see interesting things like, uh, if, I don't know if there's anybody from Trustwave within the audience, but if there is, uh, I do want to have a talk with you, uh, because we always see traffic from Trustwave um, with multiple uh, different IP addresses at the same time, trying to reach a different type of URLs, uh, URLs um, <coughs> uppercase, lowercase, everything, but always requests at the same time from different IP addresses. I want to know what's going on. So if there's somebody from Trustwave, please catch me later on the presentation. Uh, we can do some uh, um, user agents checking uh, all the data is here. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through these. These are instant messaging previews things. It's no new research, but because we have the data, you can quickly see. Uh, how the previews are generated in this case by uh, Telegram. <coughs> you need to read this from bottom to top. So this is live typed and it's building up the URL that we're uh, testing here. So uh, there's many more resources uh, at this specific link. Uh, and other red team operators are interested in public IP addresses of known domain classifiers as well. Uh, so this was a discussion that I had with one of the operators of uh, Spectre Ops, uh, Kelly. Um, because we have such data, we can easily go through and get this intel uh, to us. Then we have the catch of the day. Even we get caught by surprise sometimes. Uh, when I was asked by one of my colleagues to spin up a new uh, infrastructure with new redirectors for one of the ongoing assignments, we found this. I just spin up this fresh redirector, link it into our system, and then we suddenly get all kinds of calls from phones to whatever it is. They all came from IRM. I've got no clue what, I, what IP address uh, DigitalOcean assigned to us in this case, but this went on for hours and actually it's, it's, it's just continuously. It's still, it's still running. We, we decided to, to scoop this IP address out of the engagement because it would fill our database really fast. But I've got no clue what I'm looking at here. 
I've got some PCAPs if anyone's interested in diving into this stuff or if anyone has a clue, uh, catch me later on on the conference and we'll have a chat about it. Uh, I decided to park it for a while and, uh, and continue our daily operation. But now we have these insights, we get these kind of surprises that you normally might not even see. Okay, uh, we need to speed up. So um, one more thing I want to point, uh, touch on is we, up until now, we look at data on the external infrastructure, but we can do the same thing on the internal side. Um, can we see actions by the blue team on the internal side once we've been detected? One of the things is, for example, uh, change of a KRB TGT password update. If we come into a client and we see that the last time the password was changed was many, many, many years ago, in junior up, all of a sudden the password is changed, well, something fishy is going on. There are many more things that we can do. Uh, quick overview, um, you've got the data with Red Elk, you can do the smart query yourself. There are many interesting things that you can do. We are working on more automated alarms, but it's not up to the level that we are, uh, well, it works for us right now, but we will be improving. So two major alarms that we've got right now is uh, an IOC of ourselves seen at one of, at one of the public security service providers, Firestotal, IBM x Force, hybrid analysis, uh, and you will get an alarm when that IEC is found, as well as an unknown IP address hitting our C2, which is not tagged by one of the gray noise things uh, as being a, a typical web scanner like background noise of the internet. Okay, if you want to get in touch and helping out this project, please, please get in touch. What we've seen so far from Red Elk is still somewhat passive though. And we do gather all the, all the intel in one database and we can manually grab through that. But we felt the need also to be able to interact live when something happens. And we want to, we want to stay in control of our, our operation to act as a proper trainer for, for our customer, for the blue team and the organization behind it or with it. So in order to stay in control, we needed to move faster. We needed to be able to respond live to what's, uh, what's happening. Uh, one of the things we do, just to uh, a, a glance at how we operate, we never tend to work with Cobble Strike staging. We make our own staging. And we never tend to work with stateless uh, items on disk. So we don't want our full stage already there. Because if it's there, we can't control it anymore. We tend to find some way uh, for our initial uh, vector to download, or the initial vector and or the persistency to download the full stage and then start working. Usually, for example, to host text files somewhere, as easy as that, and download those. Um, and then we have, usually have a bot that migrates. If we have persistency in Word, we'll have a bot that will migrate to another process that will live longer than Word, because the user might kill Word after a few minutes, and if you can dive into some uh, tray icon, you can live for the rest of the day often. So what we introduced was red file. It's basically a very simple uh, Python tool that lives in your web server that can help you uh, yeah, serving files the way you need them to be served. Uh, I'll get into some, uh, some examples on that. But basically every file that you request is built live and you can code however you want it. You can do it IP based or you can have a lot of rules in there. And yes, you, you can always whitelist on IP if you want something, some IP restrictions, but you might want to be able to react on a user agent and serve a different content for a, a certain user agent. You might want to be able to react, react on the time of the day, uh, the amount of calls you get, if a certain pixel is hit before the payload is called and so on. Well, basically, I was building a lot of these tools separately and I decided it had to be easier. So I built something that works with modules. You can just have this Python shell running or this, Python, this Flux framework running. And this is a, a working code, in, well, basically 12 lines of effective code that will serve something based on, a, based on the user agents. So we can now serve whatever we want to serve. And I'm gonna walk you to, uh, through two examples of, uh, of how we use that. Uh, I think this is uh, the first one. We, we saw an, uh, an engagement where we see a customer hitting, uh, we see a proxy hitting our, our payload and then the, the real user agent comes along. Uh, we want to divert this proxy somewhere else, so at least that the investigation doesn't see something evil is going on and we want uh, uh, the, the user, of course, to get a real payload. Or can we switch to the browser? Yeah. So that's gonna be this one. 
Here we have the default payload that you will see if you come from a random IP, so an IP that has not been, that, that is not known. Uh, no, no matter how often I click this, this will, this will I get served. If I put the VPN off, now I'm just on, in, our, in our own lab environment, so it's a whitelisted IP, and I will get the, the payload that I really want to serve to the customer. Of course, an IP whitelist you can build on any web server. It's just the concept that it's really easy to build this, diversified on IP, or on any other, uh, 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 any other thing you want to divert on. Another one we have here is, uh, let me see, present of you. Take a move. What, what, what we saw at another customer is we had persistency in Word, Microsoft Word, and this uh, customer tends, this specific uh, persistency, this guy tended to select a lot of Word documents on his desktop and open them all at the same time. So we would see a lot of beacons in a few minutes. But as we have auto-migration on, in this case, we would migrate 18 times to our process we want to live in for the day. Well, as you can imagine, that's not something that's useful for us. So what did we build? We built uh, a same little module that will serve content only once in 30 seconds. So it will serve the content. If you hit a five, it will not serve you anything at all until 30 seconds later. Just, just another simple way of controlling when and how we serve content uh, to our victim. And again, the code, it's just, a, it's a one pager. It's, uh, this might not be 12 or 20 lines, but that's about it. Well, that's just how we ease our operation. But then, once we've built this, we can also use it to decoy. We can use it to see if we can serve a real payload to our victim, and another payload to the blue team. Well, let's give that a try. Uh, I build a payload that's go that goes by key. So I'm going to click this link. This is the link. This is one uh, payload with a key in it. And the first click might be for the proxy. Well, we all see get a robots.txt here. So this URL here gives you a robots.txt. If I now pre press refresh, as this might be the second call after the, the proxy has done its thing, we'll now have a default cobalt strike uh, PowerShell macro. Interesting. So SOP finds some infection and they'll start researching this URL. Once they look at the URL, they also get some PowerShell. But this seems to be a Bitcoin stealer. Is that any threat? A Bitcoin stealer, it's, it's annoying to have malware around your organization looking for Bitcoins, but unless you're a Bitcoin exchange, this is likely not going to put a high alert on, on, on you. But nevertheless, it's weird that it even comes in, so you share it with a colleague. He also looks at it, so yeah, it's, it's a Bitcoin stealer, it's odd, but how do we get this into our uh, endpoints? Why didn't we see this before? Maybe we should gather the team and have a look at it together. So they gather the team, put it on Beamer, and they request the URL again. And this is our adult sheet. Basically, what I'm trying to show you here is that it's really easy to have one URL and change it uh, as you go. For us, it's a tool that's really convenient to work alongside Red Elk. So Red Elk, we have passive information to gather data on and decide how we want to react. And then we have a red file, which we can really easily program to react how we want it and, and the way we want it. And we can decide what we want to teach the blue team. And we might be pushing them by decoying them. We might choose not to, depending on where they stand, uh, what we all decided on forehand, what, what there's to learn in this, uh, in this operation. So basically, we think red teaming should be there to make blue teams better. It should be a training game and not an ego-based win-win situation, not red against blue. Red file and red elk can be, to, as, as, uh, can be of great help to red teamers to make uh, proper reports, have all the data in one place, but also to roll a better scenario. And then, please, blue, think of your OPSEC. We always hit alarms somewhere. Thanks. <laughs>